I hope that you will give me some liberty this morning to really talk to our young people and to our children who are in the midst of our educational system today. And I'm going to ask, if you're here and you're under 25 years old, I'm going to ask you to please just listen to me for a couple of minutes. If you go on to Google right now and you Google about America under God, what you will find is that the majority of the post on the top of the Google search Will be, the, will be quotes trying to say that America is not a nation under God and that we are not a Christian nation and that we were not founded on Christianity. But we have to differentiate the difference between Christianity and the church. You see, the problem is that Christianity and the church have been equated to be the same thing, and they are not. They are not. And if you're not careful, there are quotes out there that are, they're legitimate. There are quotes that are from George Washington. There are quotes from John Adams. There are quotes from Thomas Jefferson that will give you the impression that they hated the church. Or let me change that, that they hated Christianity. But I want to show you through some of their quotes how they may seem contradictory, but in fact, within context, they make perfect sense. The reality is that if you were to take some of the sermons that I preach from this very pulpit and you were to isolate certain quotations from those sermons, it would appear that I don't like the church. It would appear that I don't even like Christianity. When in fact there are certain segments and pretenses of Christianity that I don't like and that I condemn, but I do not condemn Christianity. Does that make sense? There are forms of Christianity, there are forms of religion that I condemn openly and without apology. But I do not condemn Christianity. And within this context, I want to talk about the God of miracles. Now, give me a few moments, and I realize that some of this stuff on the front end may not seem that spiritual, but in fact, it's something that we really need to understand within our lives. We are not just a community of believers who have all things in common. Let me make sure I'm on here. I'm not. That's why. Now. Last week, I shared with you about the birth of the fellowship and how that we have become the fellowship of the children of God, the sons of God, where we share all things, all things in common. We take care of each other. We love each other. We provide for each other. We are the body of Christ. But we are more than just a group of believers who have all things in common. You see, that's called a commune. We are not just a commune. There are so many who are filling pulpits today who speak of social justice. I know Bonhoeffer, in one of his quotes, he said that if there are people who are being run over by the wheels of justice, we should not simply try to save them from under the wheels of justice, but we should drive a stake in the spokes of justice. And he's saying that we need to be active, we need to be seeking justice and bringing about true justice and not standing idly by or silently while we see people being abused. And I believe all of that. And I believe in social justice. I believe that we should be just in what we do. I believe that we should seek to correct the wrongs that we see in our society. The interesting part is that Christians have been at the forefront of many of those transformations. The rejection of slavery in this country was pushed forward not by liberals, but by the church. By the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the Christians who believed that if we truly believed that all men were created equal, and we truly did believe that God saves all men, that we didn't need to have slavery in this country. The civil rights movement, many of the people who were involved in in the civil rights movement, many of course were liberals, liberals, but many of them were 
Christians who could not justify the contradictions of what they saw and they were willing to suffer to change that injustice that our nation was perpetrating upon people of color. That was wrong and it should be corrected. When you study church history, and when I say church history, not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm talking about the earthly church, the church that we saw here on earth. We have a jaded past. If you study about the inquisitions, and you study about how they tortured people and killed and, and, and how that... But here's what happened. The church, you remember how last week I was sharing how the church was so powerful in that it ministered to the poor and the suffering and it was an answer for many people who were disenfranchised in the world of that day uh, of, of the, uh, the Greco-Roman world and its society. But something happened. About 300 A.D., suddenly Christianity got respectable. And suddenly Christianity began to be the religion of Rome. And when it became the religion of Rome, the people who held position in the church suddenly became very influential and very powerful. And these positions began to be sought not as places of service, but of power and wealth. And when you study how the church, when you study people like Savonarola, even like Martin Luther, Martin Luther, if it had not been for a little vassal king that protected him, the church would have killed him. People like John Huss, John Wycliffe, go do a little history, look, the church, they would burn them at the stake. They, they filleted them, they killed them in all kinds of ways. And, and their cry was that the church had become corrupt and evil at its leadership levels and it needed to be corrected. And they were killed. And here's how it worked. Here's, here's how it worked. If you were one of those, and, and, and something else you need to understand, there were many priests of other religions that saw that now that Christianity is going to be the powerful force, they became priests for Christianity because that was their means to get to political power and authority. And the church was infiltrated. This is all a matter of history, and I know it may sound boring, but it's important. So here's what happened. The church, if I was politically powerful through the church, and let's say Warren Wilson began to speak out against me like Savonarola did in Florence, Italy, and began to say, you are corrupt or whatever, I would brand you a heretic. And, and thus being a heretic, I would take you and throw you in a dungeon and torture you until you finally admitted, I'm a heretic. Then I would kill you because you're a heretic. So if you stood up to the politically powerful in the church, next thing you know, you're being carted off, branded as a heretic, and tortured until you finally say, fine, okay, I'm a heretic. And then they kill you because you're a heretic. They made you say you're a heretic, then they kill you because of it. It kind of reminds me of, of uh, the gulag, which would say, uh, don't tell me the crime they committed. Just tell me the person you want me to put a crime on. And we'll get rid of them. And so the church had a jaded past. But something happened. Came along a man by the name of Martin Luther who they didn't manage to kill. They had silenced the others. Like Huss and Wycliffe and others. There's a book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you don't have it, if you've never read it, you need to read it. If, you, if not that, there's another book called Valiant for the Truth. And this is about these men who gave their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther came along and said, The church isn't who saves us. It is Jesus Christ and belief in him alone and that faith that redeems us and saves us. I am saved by the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ, not by the declaration of a priest, but by the one and true high priest, which is Jesus Christ my Savior. And because of it, then there was the church that we know today created because there was only the Roman Catholic Church in all of its power and authority. But then there came the separation of the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. And then came the Reformation with Martin Luther and then the Lutherans and then the Methodists and then the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Episcopals and, and on and on and on all the way down to the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Pentecostal and all of that 
came out of that reformation where that it was no longer an earthly authority but a heavenly authority that gave me salvation. And out of that came people like the Puritans and the Quakers and some of these others who really took it to a whole other level in spiritual intimacy with God and they were being persecuted by the church and so they left and came to America so that they could worship God as they pleased without being persecuted by the king of England who saw religion as nothing more than a tool for political power. Running from the Catholic church that had persecuted them and killed them and harassed them and chased them. Now, you say, well, pastor, are you saying that somebody's a part of the Roman Catholic church, that they're, that they're, that they're lost, that they're demons or what? No. Now, look, I'm talking about abuses that happened a long time ago. There are still abuses today. That's true. But I know many Catholics who are good Christian people who love the Lord. They really do. They love God with all their heart. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking about history. Okay, hang with me for a minute. And when you go back and study the particular states of the United States, basically they were like, politic, they were like religious movements. You had certain states that were full of Quakers, other states that primarily were Lutherans. You had other states that were like Presbyterians. These states were then united under the United States, but here's something that they had witnessed. They had witnessed the abuses of the church. Now, one thing we do know is that George Washington believed in the miraculous power of God and he believed in prayer. We know that. Now, people will say, yeah, but they had slaves and Thomas Jefferson had slaves. Look, they had slaves back in the time of Jesus. Pastor, what are you saying? Slavery is okay. No, it's not okay. But it was a reality that was in the day of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you read in the New Testament and you read all of it, you'll find out in some of the epistles, it's actually talking to slaves and to slave owners and all of that. I'm not saying that slavery was right. It was just a reality that they were having to deal with in that day. And I'm not saying that the men who were the founders of this nation were perfect men. Go back and study the nation of Israel. Were they perfect? For heaven's sake, no. But they were a people who claimed God as their God and he claimed them as his people. But, but we do know that this Washington was a man who spent his first hour every day on his knees praying reading his Bible and praying and asking God's guidance. Why did he do that? We know that he said, I'm sure that never was a people who had more reason to acknowledge a divine inter interposition into their affairs than those of the United States. And I should be pained to believe that they have forgotten that agency which was so often manifested in our revolution or that they failed to consider the omnipotence of that God who alone is able to protect us. He said, look, if you, if you had been where I was, if you had witnessed the Revolutionary War from my perspective being the leader of the army, it was only God that spared us and only God's providence that gave us victory. And it was his night of prayer that led him to lead them across the Potomac and attack the British and surprise them in broad daylight. He credited that to a divine guidance of God as to what to do. So he was a man who believed in God. Now, let's go from there to a man by the name of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson says, God who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. People say, well, he was a deist. True. To much of an extent, he was a deist. Now, what is a deist? Who believes that God is, but God kind of puts us out there, gives us a spin, and lets us to our own uh, uh, vices. And every now and then, if it gets bad enough, he intervenes. But he knew and he recognized and respected the power of God. And he knew that the power of God needed to spare this nation. Our second president said that this constitution that we serve is meant for a moral and religious people, and if they are not moral nor religious, it won't work. Because there's a moral standard that is understood that we maintain. And if you remove that, this whole thing will come down like a house of cards. And friends, that's where we are today. There is no sense of absolute truth or right and wrong. 
Now, when you read some of these quotes of people like Thomas Jefferson, I want you to read it within the context of what they were writing. Now, this quote, the clergy converted the simple teachings of Jesus into an engine for enslaving mankind and adulterated by uh, our <clears throat> artificial constructions into uh, a contrivance to... Man, my words are too little here. I needed my other glasses. <laughs> to Phil's wealth and power themselves, these clergy, in fact, constitute the real Antichrist. You see, he was writing about the abuses of the church, not Christ. And we go on from there, and here's, here's a very poignant, and I want to move on with this because it's very important. Here's an understanding. Patrick Henry wrote this. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of, of, of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Do you understand what he's saying? This is not Catholic. This is not Baptist. This is not Methodist. This is not Presbyterian. This is no particular religion. This is religion being separate from Christianity. And what you're seeing is people are taking quotations out of context. And, and the context within the separation of church and state, even that statement was within a letter that says we never need to let some church take control of government, not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, some religious order, like, for instance, any particular denomination or powerful uh, religious order does not need to take control of our nation. That we need to let people worship God ever how they choose. Even the Muslims who come, we need to let them have freedom because once you start saying only this particular type right here, and some would say, well, I want, I want our, our nation to be more conservative. I want our nation to be more godly in this way or that way. Understand that when you start down that road and you go to that place where you start saying, we're going to do it the way I think it ought to be done, then we restrict someone else from doing it the way they feel God is leading them to do that. I told you in this church, I've said, look, if you're perfectly happy, if you love everything that happens in this church, you are perfectly happy somebody else is miserable. That's the truth. And so as we look at this nation, the problem is, and this may sound a little crazy right here, and my goodness, I should have blown this up bigger. The government of the United States is not formed on the Christian religion. Now this is John Adams. It's not formed on the Christian religion. It didn't say it wasn't formed on Christianity or the principles of Christianity or the teachings of Christ. And we find here with uh, Thomas Jefferson, he talks about the abuses of the church, and I can't even read my own writing. It's too small, and I apologize for that. But then when you, James Madison writes, and what he writes about is all the abuses of the church and how that the church is tortured and and maimed and destroyed and killed and everything else. And the reason for America's creation was we don't want the church to run things, meaning religion to run things. We want people to be able to have a personal conviction with Jesus Christ and not some church prescribe and describe to them how they have to do all of their worship unto God. They were not saying we reject God, we reject anything about Christianity. They were saying Christianity, when it is twisted and contorted, we have no respect for it. Now, I know there's some other quotes that can be quite disturbing, but to sit here and say that our founding fathers had no, no belief in God, no trust in God, no concept of his omnipotence and power, I think is, is foolishness. Go to Washington. Just walk around and look at the monuments and see what's written on them and read the quotes and understand that this is a nation that recognizes from its very foundational document our rights are given us by God the Creator. But yet, revisionist historians are trying to tell us, oh no, it was just some kind of a political ploy to control the masses. 
And why did George Washington, upon being inaugurated as the first president, why did he lead all of Congress and a huge crowd down to a field to spend a time in prayer dedicating this nation unto God? Do you know where that field was? That field was where the Twin Towers were built. And you've heard, there's a book called The Harbinger you can read. And I'm telling you, friends, that if we don't turn our path around, God's judgment is coming. I believe Thomas Jefferson is right. If, if, look, I know God and I know his sense of justice. And, and if we forget God and we walk away from God, we forget he's the one that sustains us. And we need to respect God in this nation. But why do we not respect God? Why is there no fear of God in this nation anymore? Why is there no respect for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe much of it is because they have not seen what Jesus Christ meant for us to be. He meant for us to be Holy Spirit in energized disciples of Jesus Christ going forth, healing the sick, declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ without apology... In the first face of persecution, he meant for the church to be a powerful force in the world. And it was until it lost its way. Now the church, the church is moving all over the world. But here's the interesting part. Here's the interesting part. Many of your churches that don't really practice the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, they are diminishing but the Pentecostal movement is exploding. Why? There is the demonstration of the power of God. You see, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I encourage you to read his true discipleship and his book about discipleship, who was killed in World War II because he stood up against Nazism. He said, if religion is only the garb in which Christianity is clothed, and this garb has looked very different in different ages, what then is religionless Christianity? What are we to look like? I'll tell you what we ought to look like. Just like the prayer that I, I, I read last Sunday where we ought to be caring for the widows and the orphans and the poor and the suffering. Just what God created the church to do and to care for the lost and dying world and to see every person of great value and worth Jesus Christ dying on the cross for them. That's what God desires us to be. The reason Smith Wigglesworth is one of my heroes great evangelist that swept around the world and preached the gospel so powerfully, it was said that he would walk into a room and people would just, by his very presence there, just began to weep and break down in conviction because the power and the presence of Jesus Christ was so real upon him. The reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible occasionally, and praying sometimes. It is an awful thing for me to see people who profess to be Christians, lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel to unbelievers' lives that it is difficult to tell which place they are in, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. Woo, how true is that of our day and time. So yes, sometimes when you hear me speak of the church, when I speak of the adulterated church, when I speak of the church that has lost its faith in Jesus Christ, uh, when we don't sink, you see, this morning we, we purposely sang, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe he was the son of the living God. I believe that he rose again. I believe that he's calling us up there one day in the resurrection. I believe all of this stuff. And did you know only, only about 35% of the pastors who fill pulpits in the United States today believe all of that? So yes, I speak against that church. I speak against that godlessness. I speak against that sense that has rejected the power of Jesus Christ and that every one of us will stand before an omnipotent God and give an account for our lives. And our name will either be written in the Lamb's book of life or it will not. And if it is not, we will be lost and thrown into outer darkness. You see, now we're being told there is no hell. There is no judgment. There is only love. There is only grace. No, there is an omnipotent God. And our founding fathers understood that we were held account and give account to him. But many of us today, why are we powerless? We are powerless because we are prayerless. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. We don't spend time in prayer. We just 
expect the kingdom of God to just happen. Even at one point, Jesus looks and he said, some only come out by prayer and fasting. What does he mean? Does he mean by the means of prayer and fasting that they come out? Or does it mean only a life who has spent time praying and fasting and truly putting themselves in the power of Jesus Christ can manifest enough authority to cast some demons out? Folks, we are in a very dark place. In this city, we rival cities like Chicago when it comes to per capita. In Chicago, last weekend, the weekend before, I didn't hear this weekend, the weekend before, not this weekend, but the previous weekend, I think it was 47 people got shot in Chicago. That's a war zone, folks. That's a war zone. But here in Jackson, if you take their population and you extrapolate the numbers out and you take our population and the number of shootings and all that take place, you see the news every night. We're just as bad as Chicago. We just don't have as many people. This is a dark place. We desperately need Jesus Christ. And yes, our sons are being killed every day. And they're our sons. It doesn't matter what the color of their skin is. They're our sons. And they're dying. Someone looked at me one day and said, well, I guess you like ministering to black folks. I said, no. It's not about what color they are. There are kids who are suffering. There are people who are dying. I don't care what the color of their skin is. They just happen to be black in Jackson most of the time. Do you hear me here? We've got to understand that there's a darkness that is snatching lives into eternity. And we need to get serious about it. We need to get down and get on our knees and begin to pray for the power of God to begin to manifest itself. Yes, the world is tired of looking at a powerless, heartless, careless church. They need a church set on fire by the power of Jesus Christ. We need to begin to believe what the Word of God says. E.W. Kenyon, Jesus has given you the right to use this name. That name can break the power of disease, the power of adverse adversary. The name can stop diseases and failure, from, and, and failure from reigning over you. There's no disease that can ever come to man which the name cannot destroy. We need to remember the name that we speak. It is the name of Jesus. And at that name, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Disease has to flee. Demons have to run when we speak the name of Jesus. But Jesus said in that day, if I am in you and you are in me, then you can ask whatever you will. But the problem is we are godless. And we are claiming his name while being godless and that doesn't work. It says I have to be in you and you have to be in me. Then you can say or you can ask and it will be done. So we need to become a people of prayer. You see, in Acts chapter 4, and this is where I pick up about, so I'm going to start preaching my sermon now. That was my introduction. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. You see, right after the end of chapter 2, where the, the fellowship is born, in the beginning of chapter 3, Peter and John are going into the temple to meet with the believers one day, as they did every day, and suddenly they looked upon a lame man who had been there from the time he was a child, and suddenly the Holy Spirit quickened them, and they looked to him. He looked at them, thought they were going to give him something, and they said, we don't have any silver or gold. We don't have any money, but I'll tell you what we do have. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Then they reached down and took his hand and lifted him to his feet, and he went running and leaping and praising through the temple, healed in the name of Jesus Christ. But the religious authorities called the disciples in. By what authority have you done this? They said, well, it's in the name of Jesus. You can't do that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> the lame man goes, uh, I believe they did. I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I'd like to go run a little more if you don't mind. 
I haven't done it in my whole life. I'd like to go run and jump a little bit more. Is that all right with you? Because I've never walked in my whole life. I believe they can. I don't know this guy, Jesus. I don't know much about him, but I like him. Because all my life I laid there while you walked me by me. But this day they called his name and I got up. You go on to verse 15 through 18. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. Uh-oh, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. What are we going to do with these men, they ask. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle, and we can't deny it. I mean, there's the guy standing right there. What can we say? But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in the name, in this name, this name of Jesus. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, I want to tell you something this morning. If we start living Christian lives with power and miracles begin to manifest themselves among us, do not think that it will quiet all criticism. When the lame man was healed, persecution increased because of men recognized. Listen to me. If men recognize they stand accountable for an, before an omnipotent God, they must make excuse and if, if they have no remedy. And they have no remedy if they have not Christ. You see, people without Christ want to explain away the need of Christ because their only remedy is Christ. If there is an omnipotent God and we do stand accountable before him, the only remedy is Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. But if you don't have Jesus, you're trying to excuse yourself, but you have no excuse. And so do not think that it will quiet all controversy and all persecution. As a matter of fact, they called them back in. But Peter and John replied after they were warned and said, Don't you talk about this Jesus anymore. And judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Look, we can't help talk about this. After further threats, they let them go. And they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. That man had laid around there for over 35 years probably, at least laying around there for 35 years, and suddenly he's running and leaping. You can't argue with that. And friends, when we become the Lord Jesus Christ's church that he desires us to be, then suddenly men who walked in addiction for two decades, uh, suddenly they're changed and they're transformed and they're different and the world doesn't have an answer for that. But we know the answer is Jesus. When Jesus shows up, people who are homeless uh, for a couple of decades become the leaders of the homeless ministry and God begins to bless them. A man who was an alcoholic becomes the pastor of Southside Assembly of God for 25 years. You see, that's when Jesus shows up. You see, they can't argue with that, but they can argue with a powerless church who says nothing and does nothing and accomplishes nothing. They can criticize, but I want to see the lame walk. I want to see the blind see. I want to see the deaf hear. I want to see God move with miracles. He who can speak out of the abundance of God's word, the wealth of directions, admonitions, and consolations of the scriptures will be able through God's word to drive out demons and help his brother, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. When you really become a disciple of Jesus Christ, it says these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall cast out demons. They shall heal the sick. Hallelujah. That's the evidence that God's power is with us. If you look at missions, if you look at missions around the world today, miracles are taking place everywhere. People are being healed. I love reading about the one story there in Africa where outside of this church they have a stack of logs. And when people ask, what are those logs? <laughs> they say those are the logs that they used to chain the demoniacs to. Because they couldn't contain them, so they would chain them to a big log so that it would keep them away from people, from harming people. But Jesus Christ delivered them. They don't need the log anymore. They don't need the chains anymore. Like the lame man of Gadarenes, uh, they have been set free, and now the log lays there to remind us that God still sets the captive free. 
I remember when I went out to a Los, uh, Lynette and I went out to Angeles Temple out in California in Los Angeles. And there as Amy McSimple McPherson began to preach and God began to do miracles. You walk, I don't know what it looks like now. This was years ago. We walked in and walked around the foyer and there in the foyer in display cases are wheelchairs and crutches and all kinds of implements uh, that people left there because they came in crippled and they walked out of their own power because Jesus is a living and powerful God. Friends, that prayer that I put before you last week is a cry of my heart. But I believe we're not going to see a great move of God until we become people of prayer. And when we become people of prayer and we let Jesus get us in us, then Jesus can get out of us. And when Jesus gets among the people, Jesus heals the sick. When Jesus gets among the people, Jesus heals the sick. The reason there is no fear of God in this day and time is that they have seen nothing worth, worthy of their fear. The words of a loving and benevolent Savior alone will move the heart and emotions, but only the power of the resurrected Christ can change a life forever. The story of Jesus Christ is powerful. A love so great that you would die upon a cross for someone else, for someone else's sin, for someone else's guilt, that you would die there. That's a powerful story, and it moves me. But folks, if he had not been raised from the dead, he would have been nothing more than a great man who led me to love and to care and to be gracious. So did Mahatma Gandhi. But there's a difference between Mahatma Gandhi and Jesus Christ. Because on the third day, he didn't stay in the grave. On the third day, he rose again. And that changes everything. That changes everything. There are the bones of many great religious leaders who are littered in graves all around this world, but there's only one risen Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said that my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Let me tell you something, friends. It is when we get right with God, as our musicians come, I'm going to ask Brother Harold Aids to come for just a second. He's going to share something with you for a couple of minutes. I want you to know that Brother Harold has copies of that prayer from last week. Many have asked for that. He has copies of that. Do you have some people you want to hand those out? Yeah, I can, or either put them on the altar after the service. I believe we'll have some people just go around. If you want a copy of that, give me this microphone again. If you want a copy of that, then I want you to request it as they walk down the aisles. I want us to begin to pray this prayer because I, I believe that we need God to manifest himself in this day and time because we have a world that needs a powerful Jesus. They're under the power of sin. They need a powerful Jesus to set them free. We need to pray. Last week, I pastor preached a sermon, beginning of the fellowship. I just felt at that time when he read this prayer that he concluded with this prayer that God had gave him back in March of 2008. I have had this prayer in my Bible since then. And I have to confess and to the Lord that I hadn't prayed this prayer. It's just been there. It's been there. But I believe that this is a call for us to fast and pray. It's not only a prayer, but it's a cry. Our pastor has now blown the trumpet and sounded the alarm. Just like when I was a fireman, I didn't have an option not to answer the alarm. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that when we pray and when we fast, it's not an option if we pray or if we fast. He has commanded us to do this. So now you ask me, how do, how do we do this? How do we pray? How do we get to the heart of God? What do we need to do? The answer is right here, right in front of our eyes. It's right there. That's like my wife showed me one day above those drums. Pray, period. That's it. That's all he asked for us. Pray, period. Pray, period. So this prayer has been printed. And everyone that wants one, it's available. This is a time that we must lift up our church, our pastor, and staff before the Lord. 
not only in the private prayer, but in corporate prayer here in the church. And in your bulletin, there's, there's a list there of the times that there's corporate prayer, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Next Sunday, there'll be a list in there where this church will be open seven days a week for you to come and pray. I believe the Lord's going to perform miracles in these prayer meetings. I've already seen them. I, I'm going to see more. But I think, I think the Lord really wants us to come together in these corporate prayers. Finally, I want to tell you like Elijah told Ahab in 1 Kings 18. I hear that sound of a heavy rain. If we, like Elijah, will climb to the top of Mount Carmel, bend down to the ground and put our faith between our knees, I believe then, as in 1 Samuel chapter 20, <laughs> verse 16, that we as a church, we will be able to stand and see this great thing that the Lord is about to do before our eyes. I would ask our, our men to come and begin to hand out communion implements this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is instructing the church. And this is what he says. He said, when you come together for your feast, which when they had communion, they had a meal. They didn't just eat a little tiny wafer and drink a little tiny glass. They had a meal, just like the upper room meal when Jesus and his disciples met in John 13. And Paul said this. He said, there's a problem because when you come together, the wealthy sit over here to the side and they eat and they drink to the point that they are drunk and have overeat. But the poor on the other side have nothing to eat and nothing to drink. He said, because of it, there are many among you who sleep. Now, when he talks of sleep, he doesn't mean that your church service is so boring that people fall asleep. No. He means that many among you have died. And he said this. He said, many among you have died because you have not properly discerned the body of Christ. Now, it was not that they didn't eat the bread right. It wasn't that they didn't drink the wine right. He was talking about the body of Christ. You see, we find in his other writings, what is the body of Christ? We are the body of Christ. He said, you haven't discerned the body. You have not. You have give preference to certain people and you have, and you sit over here and eat while another brother is over here with nothing to eat. Why have you not shared your food? Why have you not shared your wine? Why have you done that? And because of it, some of you have died senselessly and needlessly. Now, I don't think it's an injustice to the Scripture to, in, to interpret out of that that what he means is that they could have been healed. They could have been healed. But you've become powerless. I remember reading one quote, and I wish I could remember who said it. I think it was David Ravenhill who said this. He said, we ask God to give us power to cast out demons, and we don't even have the power to turn the TV off. We got to get real, people. You see, you could take my words totally out of context. Back about 15 years ago, I stood right up there, 15, 16 years, 14, I don't know, I can't remember. And I said, I'm tired of having church. I don't want to have church anymore. No more. I've been doing this for 20-something years, 30 years. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to have church anymore. Now, wow, think about if that was published. But then I went on to say, However, I do want to be the church. I want to quit talking about it and do it. I want to quit 
saying what we are and not being what we should be. And so this communion this morning, you see, the communion, think about it, the body of Christ that bore the chastisement of our, of our guilt, bore the punishment, the blood that cleanses us, the blood that seals the covenant of grace through which God saves us. So what am I asking you to do this morning? Would you stand with me? Has everyone been served pretty much? You got one more row to go? Is everyone served? Some people say, well, Pastor, why do you keep asking people to come to the front? Because I want people to have some visible action that backs up, something that makes them stand out and say, you know what? I want people to know this is what I believe. If you're with me and you're willing to come and say, God, you know what? We're not being the body you desire us to be. You were the body you needed to be because you were sinless. You were perfect. You were without sin. Pastor, we can't be sinless. No, we can't, but we can be sinners that constantly and regularly repent of our sin and turn from it and try to our best ability to live in the power of God and let his grace cover us. God, I'm committing that I'm, I want to be the body you want me to be. I'm looking for people who will come with the cup and say, God, I know that the only way it can ever happen is if the blood of Jesus covers me and that if I covenant with you because it is your power, it is your authority, it is your grace, it is your forgiveness, it is you, it's not me. And I can't be your body without you because you are the head. If that's you, you want to be the church. You want to be the body of Christ. You don't want to be a religious order. You don't want to be a denomination. You want to be the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You really do. You want to be real. You want to be genuine. You want God to move. And, and let me tell you something. You really make yourself available to God. He will change things in your life. He will change things in your life. Some of you are perfectly comfortable where you are. I'm not looking for you. Someone who says, make me uncomfortable if you need God, but I want to be your body. I want to be your body. Lord Jesus, I know that you take note. I feel like Elisha, when he returned to the river after Elijah had been taken from him and he cried out and Elijah had dropped his cloak and Elisha took that cloak and wrapped it around himself and he walked to the river and then he took the cloak off and he rolled it up just like Elijah had done when they came across the river the other direction. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he smote the waters. And they parted. And he walked across. And he walked into a destiny of one of the greatest prophets that the nation of Israel had known and has ever known. He's up there with Elijah, and Elisha, and Moses. Isaiah and those guys is the greatest of the prophets. Jesus, I'm asking you. We want to see the Lord God of Elijah. We are your body. Empower your body. As real as I take this bread and put it in my mouth, may your spirit be put in me. Your living expression here on this earth, you said would live in me. Live in me, Jesus. Let me be your body. Let us partake. And if you call this body to the wilderness to fast, I will fast. 
I will become your hands and your feet. But Lord, I cannot do it without your power. It is not complete until we seal the covenant. I am sinful. I am carnal. I am man. I am fleshly. I need you to cleanse me. I need your life-giving power, your covenant, your blood to flow through my spiritual veins. I need you to be my life, for life is in the blood. Give me your life. Lord, even as the day of Pentecost, you said, don't go anywhere until you be empowered. I've got to be empowered if we're ever going to be your church. I've got to be empowered. I've got to have your spirit. I've got to have your anointing. Cleanse me, purify me, anoint me, fill me, overflow me, empower me, God, with the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to be the powerless church of Corinthians chapter 11. God, I want to be a church where the sick are healed, where the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. The demoniac is set free and sits clothed and in his right mind. I want to be your church. We want to be your people. Jesus, I covenant with you. Manifest yourself in us. We want to be your church, and I agree to that, God, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, wherever it takes me. In Jesus' name, let us partake. Hear us from heaven, O oh God. Hear our supplication, O oh God. O oh Holy Spirit, come upon your people. Lord, in the hours of prayer, suddenly an anointing will come upon us. In the midnight hour, all alone, suddenly we'll understand what it means to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, to have the anointing of God rest down upon us. Hear our cry, O oh God. We have humbled ourselves before you, and you have said that you will come and heal your land. God, begin here, right now, right in this place, in this church, in this community, in this city, God. Begin to move in this place. We need you. We need you. We need you now. We need your power now. We need your presence now. We need you, oh God, to manifest yourself among us. For we are your people, and we cry for your power, and we cry for your presence. Come into our midst in Jesus' name. Lord would say to each of us, this is his word that he instructs. I didn't have this in my notes. This is what the Holy Spirit is speaking into my spirit. I've chosen not to move among you at this time in a manifestation that would be in the midst of all of these around you. For my relationship with you must be intimate and personal. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that you have equated my moving among the people as moving among you. That you have equated what you feel of my presence in the midst of my people as being my presence in the midst of you. But I desire to come into you wholly and completely. Go through every fiber of your being and change everything in you. And that will be in the private time. That will be in the intimate moment with me. That will be in a time and a place where it is you and me. So find that place of prayer. Find that place of intimacy with me. And know that I will come and be your God. And I will change you. And I will transform you. And my spirit will come upon you. And you will be different than you were before. Because my presence is now in you and on you. For the eyes of the Lord, as I have said, go to and fro throughout all the earth to move mightily upon those whose hearts are stayed on me stay your hearts on me focus your mind on me your heart on me 
give me times of prayer and open your heart and listen so that I might speak for I will speak to you and I will give you words and I will give you understanding and I will give you anointing and I will give you power and I will give you guidance and I will lead your steps and anoint your hands to be my church if you will be my people. Lord, we receive the word of God. Your Holy Spirit's direction in God, we will go this week and we will find those places of prayer with you, Lord. We will find those places of prayer with you. And you will come with your anointing, O oh God, we truly believe. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to find someone to say, let's call each other this week and remind each other, have you prayed? Have you found time with God? Have you found a time alone with Him? Do not go through this week without spending that time with Him. Hallelujah. Agree together with someone to be held accountable that this week we will find that place of prayer that inner place with God.